The Unshackled Waves, episode 179. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello, everyone. Great to have your company on this special live edition of the show. It's definitely on now. There was another leadership spill this week in the federal government. Speculation about Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull's leadership turbocharged after the disaster for the coalition and the Super Saturday by-elections. Conservatives last week uh, planted in the news. They were pushing Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton to challenge Malcolm Turnbull. A backbench revolt on their neg uh, followed by a horror uh, Fairfax it Ipsos poll on the weekend saw Peter Dutton strike at today's Liberal Party room meeting after Turnbull called a spill, losing 35 to 48 votes and going to the backbench. But it is by no means over at all. So to analyse the, the power plays today and the past week and to see what happens next, I'm joined by the Unshackled's political editor, Michael Smythe. Hi, Tim. Good to be back. Now, we decided to uh, do the first ever live uh, episode of the show because by the time, because we normally pre record this and then uh, upload it a day or so later, but what we say now could be out of date by tomorrow. <laughs> Indeed, it is. And apologies for my own technical difficulties to all of our viewers. It has been a very crazy past four days, about uh, five days now, actually, from Friday morning when. My phone was running hot with information on what was being thought about and talked about in Canberra until today when I made a cheeky bet on sports bet and hit the jackpot, so to speak. And the surprising move by Turnbull this morning uh, to call a leadership spill there and then, hopefully to, in his mind, hopefully to take the steam out of Dutton's push for the leadership. Yes, uh, it all happened uh, last week. It was the what I call the National Energy Guarantee power failure. Uh, there was uh, it passed the the joint uh, coalition uh, party room, the National Energy Guarantee, uh, this time last Tuesday, and uh, but then uh, there was ten uh, coalition backbenchers who reserved their right to uh, cross the floor, and then there was Keith Pitt, who is a, a junior uh, government minister. He's a national. He said that. Uh, he would uh, resign. Mm, mm, that's right. And even as early as Friday afternoon, Turnbull was making concessions to the dissenters to try and see off a, a 2009-esque challenge to his leadership. But the concessions that he was making were insufficient to persuade the dissenters away from agitating against Turnbull's leadership. And so there was this, or if, it was 10 confirmed, but then uh, media commentators, conservative commentators were saying throughout the week, oh, there's about uh, 20, 20 or 25 who are considering uh, crossing the floor. And uh, then what really uh, uh, set uh, the wheels in motion was uh, Peter Dutton. He appears uh, every Thursday on uh, 2GB, uh, Sydney Radio Ray Hadley's morning program, and of course Ray Hadley, he uh, he he's known for uh, grilling uh, well any any type of guests uh, who who are in the hot seat. And if you remember, he used to have Scott Morrison as a as a regular uh, back when Tony Abbott was Prime Minister. But after uh, Ray Hadley gave gave him quite a grilling over his uh, betrayal of of Tony Abbott, he didn't go back, and so Dutton was in the hot seat, and he was pushed on. The, the National Energy Guarantee, and uh, Dutton said that if I get to a point where I can't support the cabinet position, then the Westminster system says that uh, you uh, re you resign your your post and and go to go to the back bench. And he didn't say at all whether he supported the uh, National 
uh, energy guarantee. He just said that, oh, I, uh, as part of the uh, the cabinet, I put my view forth, and the, this is you know what will happen if I can't agree to it. Basically, uh, leaving the door open for for him to uh, quit and go to the back bench. That's exactly right, Tim. As I commented to someone on Friday night, because there was, as you know, there was a lot of banter and whispers going on, not just amongst our fellow contributors and editors, but also all of our political contacts, pointing out that if he doesn't challenge after this, then he is a coward, but he has no spine and several other unkind things that they were going to say about him. But the comment that I made to a friend who is not political is that Tur um, not Turnbull, Dutton's interview with Hadley on 2GB was a warning shot that Turnbull needs to pay attention to the backbench because the backbench represents the base of the party as well. He needs to listen to the backbench and by extension the base of the party if he wants to have a chance at keeping them on side, let alone winning the next general election, which to be honest, I don't think anyone could do, not Dutton, not Abbott, and certainly not Turnbull. And so that was on the Thursday. I, I thought well, when we were planning this uh, today, we were sort of like, oh, where do we begin? Because just so much happened, but we're just uh, summarizing the past week. So there was the, the interview, Hadley interview on the Thursday. And then in the, the News Corp papers on the Friday, there was a story by Sherry Markson where uh, conservative backbenchers had said they're encouraging uh, Peter Dutton to challenge Malcolm Turnbull and Dutton was reported as being uh, torn. Uh, it's the, the mainstream media, uh, like if you watch Insiders or that, they just say, oh, you know, it's, uh, it's a car full of disgruntled Abbott supporters who are, who are pushing this. Uh, it won't uh, uh, amount to, to anything. Mm. But clearly they were mistaken in their dismissal of uh, Dutton's potential challenge. As a result, when you look at the results today of the 35 MPs who voted for Dutton, there are quite a few MPs who voted for Dutton who did not vote for Abbott in 2015. And not all of them were Queenslanders either who switched their support from um, Turnbull to Dutton as opposed from Abbott to Turnbull. And you know that, that this was a real uh, push uh, because on the, the Friday afternoon there was the, the neg back down where Malcolm Turnbull put in at about what, six o'clock that evening that uh, he would no longer legislate the 26% the reduction uh, in emissions by 2030 that they committed to in the Paris uh, Climate Accord, uh, which uh, was as we saw, the, the beginning of a, a number of concessions. And you know when Turnbull uh, backs down on what is one of his uh, big uh, policy issues, climate change, then you know that it's pre he's pretty much in self-preservation mode. Mm -hmm. He's running scared. He's been running scared since Friday night when he pulled that uh, announcement out. And we were discussing it privately and we were thinking, <laughs> it's 2009 all over again. Well, we didn't say that exactly, but it could end up being 2009 over again. A second spill will happen, count on it and Turnbull will lose the leadership once again over an energy-related issue. It's unfortunate for him that he values his ambition and his position over what is actually good for the electorate. And, you know, I hate Bill Shorten, obviously, but Shorten did point out today when he moved his absurd no confidence motion that um the table didn't stand for anything you know the things that he used to stand for he backed down from just to appease the backbench it wasn't just to appease the backbench it was to keep his position intact but you know what they say two spills are what usually what it takes to change a leadership so it happened with um it's happened several times in history mark latham was going over it on his outsiders page and of course, the most obvious examples we can think of was Tony Abbott in 2015 called a 
leadership spill in February of 2015, and no one put their hands up at the time. And then September, when Turnbull immediately resigned his commission and said, I'm challenging for the Liberal Party leadership. That was what um, ended Abbott's uh, tenure as Prime Minister. It usually takes two spills for it to happen. It was the same with um, Rudd and Gillard as well, when Rudd came, eventually came back to power. The first spill was unsuccessful, the second one was. Same with um, Hawke and Keating as well. Keating challenged and lost, then he challenged again and won. It's just history repeating. I was a bit cheeky on my Facebook today, um, linking Shirley Bassey's history repeating on my Facebook page. It's true, though. It's just a little bit of history repeating. You know, that's the nature of politics in this country. We have our leadership spills, or the parties have their leadership spills, and they go, there's one down, one more to go before you get a change in the leader. Uh, uh, the only exception to that rule in history is the initial, uh, the thing that kicked off this uh, revolving door of prime ministership, which was the 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 Rudd uh, spill in in 2010, where uh, Kevin Rudd he was prime minister one day, then on the Wednesday night there was uh, all of a sudden this move to for Julie Gillard, and she was prime minister the next day. That's the exception to the rule. But when uh, normally what the rule is when there's a period of uh, destabilization and speculation, that's when the, the, the two strike uh, strategy comes into it. And it's, it's interesting you talk about uh, Abbott 20, 2015 because uh, the, the second strike, what happened was there was a, a News Corp story on the, the Friday saying that uh, Abbott was considering a major uh, reshuffle and that's what set the wheels in motion on the, the weekend before the, the sitting week came back and the exact same things happened with a story on the Friday uh, for a, a leadership spill uh, early in the week and of course what also uh, set the wheels in motion for this was uh, a Fairfax Ipsos poll on Sunday, which was really, really bad for the Turnbull government. They were losing the two-party preferred vote to Labor 45 to 55, with a primary vote of just 33%. Malcolm Turnbull suffered a nine-point drop in his preferred Prime Minister ranking of 48%, uh, but he's still leading Shorten on 36%. Now, I think the reason, well, this poll is just terrible. Uh, it's, it's, one, it's one of the worst. And the fact that Super Saturday basically showed a mini federal election. And so backbenchers would have seen that and said, well, we're, we're, we have seen the, uh, the, the preview of, uh, of the federal election, and it's being confirmed in this first poll afterwards, shit, we're going down. Mm -hmm, exactly. Now, I actually thought, uh, there are a couple of things I need to point out here. The the polling in Longman, as you know, suggested that it was going to be extremely close, but mm. they pretty much declared it on the night that Labor had won. For it to have been closer than it was, would have required every single One Nation preference to go to the LNP, to um, Big Trev Rothenberg, but it didn't. So as a result, Susan Lamb actually increased her margin. But another thing that needs to be pointed out here, the second thing I need to point out here, is that the poll um, done by Fairfax and Ipsos, it's, I don't want to say it's a dodgy poll, but the thing is, saying a 55 to 45 two-party preferred vote, that doesn't quite sound right to me. And yes, even factoring in the margin of error, it doesn't really sound correct to me. It sounds, it should, to my mind, it should be more 53, 47, or give or take a fraction of a percent. But the... But you're right to say that the poll would certainly have sent them all very scared. And there are a lot of people who voted um, in the spill today who would have seen the results of the polling and started to run scared themselves and decide, okay, the only way we can win or survive in our seats is if we save the furniture. So we're going to transfer to Dutton because Dutton He's not, he's not particularly liked outside of Queensland, but he is not hated either, except by the rabid far left. 
Now, of course, uh, one of the main drivers of this uh, leadership speculation and destabilization of Turnbull, well, Turnbull's <laughs> done a lot of destabilizing himself with his uh, poor political judgments over the past uh, three years as uh, Prime Minister, of course, is, is Tony Abbott. And now Tony Abbott has realized that he's not going to become Prime Minister again, but he can destroy Turnbull. That's his primary goal, is to basically tear Turnbull down. He's still <laughs> very salty about uh, being deposed after just uh, two years. And uh, it was interesting, he attended several uh, LNP events on the, on the weekend where he was uh, gleefully talking up a, a leadership uh, spill. And uh, <laughs> he told a, a group of Tasmanian young liberals that he was looking forward to serving in a Dutton ministry. <laughs> it wasn't just in Tasmania that he was saying that either. Now, I, I know uh, that he was in Queensland as well. That's where, mm, that's where mm. else he was. Yes, I was actually, what was I doing Saturday night? Oh, I was having fun with a few friends, um, lots of drinks, and also a lot of people from other political parties. We get together and we have drinks every now and then. Basically, it's a once a month thing. Anyway, I digress. Um, one of the things I, I don't know if I told you this already or not, but I'll say for the benefit of everyone anyway, um, apparently, and I haven't confirmed this, myself but i wouldn't be surprised if it was true and turnbull was talking in one of the party room meetings that they have and abbott butted in and interrupted him and turnbull said to abbott oh you know could you let me finish my sentence please It'd be nice if i could finish my sentence and abbott replied with well it wouldn't be nice if i could have finished my full term <laughs> and it's like oh Burn. You, you, you just imagine that video of all the guys going, Aah! I would have loved to have been a fly in the room for that. And if I'd been seen next to Abbott, I would have actually had that video waiting for him to do that because I'd, I'm, I'm just surprised it didn't happen sooner. <laughs> this is if it did happen, of course. But I would have been doing that. I also have to be careful just how much I say for obvious reasons because I am friends with some of the people in today's shenanigans i also used to be friends with other people involved in today's shenanigans so i have to choose my words carefully of course and plus you know it's unbecoming of the political editor to be indiscreet but the thing is with abbott verbally articulating his contempt for turnbull outright it does clear the way for dutton to make a challenge in the first place. The thing was about today, Dunn hadn't challenged. Dunn hadn't challenged. Was, the leadership spill was dropped on them this morning. Pardon me. Which means that if, now that he is on the backbench, he has all the time and leeway to make another, to make an actual challenge for the leadership. And Abbott will back him because of his grudge. Abbott sees Turnbull the same way John Gorton saw Billy McMahon. It's going to be very interesting. And count on another spill happening either this week or next week. I would actually put money on that. So what oh, happened? Wait, I did put money on that. Yeah. <laughs> the, the same night as the, the horror uh, Ipsos poll came out was there was a cabinet... Uh, dinner, which uh, Dutton didn't arrive until afterwards, which, uh, of course, everyone wondered, well, was that I intentional? It looked intentional, intentional, and it was dubbed uh, in the media as the last uh, supper. And now, on the, <laughs> on the Monday morning was when, when I call, it was the, the reneg, uh, where uh, Malcolm Turnbull appeared with Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg. Not only were they dumping the legislated emissions reductions, but they were going to have a default cap on electricity prices for uh, customers, uh, increased financial penalties for the big three energy suppliers if they, they broke those, underwrite new uh, energy projects that add more reliable baseload power to the grid, and also new powers for the ACCC see to uh, force uh, energy providers to sell uh, their assets if they're deemed to have 
too much uh, market power. And so uh, it was t a Turnbull, he, he, he's basically, he's cooked either way because if he completely capitulates on uh, energy, then he, he, ba he basically... Uh, looks like he's given up everything that he's ever stood for. Uh, uh, but of course, if he stays with the current course that he is, he's still labor light. Mm -hmm. He's damned if he does. He's damned if he doesn't. That's what it comes down to. But the thing is, Turnbull has never had any ideology as such. He has always been about himself first and foremost. And he has been able to... Well, he was able for the first two years of the Abbott government to pretend to be a team player all the while while simmering underneath about the fact that Abbott succeeded where he failed. But that's the thing, and a lot of people don't understand this because people are saying, oh, Dutton can't do it, Abbott certainly can't do it. It's like, well, yes, that's true, but that's missing the point. The most convincing Liberal Party victories have been won when a, an actual conservative was in power. John Howard in 1996 and until 2004. Uh, Tony Abbott in 2013. Bearing in mind in 2010, he only barely lost the 2010 election. In fact, no one won the 2010 election really. Gillard only formed government because she had the two treacherous independents um, Windsor and Oakshot back her along with the Greens guy and um, yeah with the Greens guy and Andrew Wilkie Andrew, okay. Andrew Wilkie yeah sorry he's ex-Greens sorry I should say he was technically ex-Greens not actually a Greens member now so he, obviously the Greens are going to back Labour um, Wilkie backed Labour and then the two treacherous independents and Cadda seeing how this was going to go down, sided with the coalition, a very cynical but very clever move. Well, he survived. He was the one one survivor of the rural independence. Well, yeah. He's also a, he's also a decent human being um, who has principles, but that's neither here nor there. He would have retained his seat regardless because Mount Isa is his home and it's highly unlikely that anyone is going to win this seat unless they have the surname of Cata, or at least for the next... 20 or 30 years now i was expecting or i was uh, uh planning the possibility that there could be a leadership spill after question time on monday just because that's uh, when the the spill happened in 2015 malcolm turnbull yeah. went to tony abbott after question time and said i'm challenging you and then gave his press conference afterwards but that uh didn't happen uh, instead uh, sky news they just showed a whole bunch of uh, funny photos of uh, malcolm turnbull looking glum and peter dutton smiling but then there was the uh liberal party room meeting this morning and then there was a surprise uh, spill sprung on by turnbull hoping to of course uh, flush out uh the, uh, the people who are conservatives who've been plotting against him and catch uh, Peter Dutton off guard. But of course, it didn't work out that way with uh, 48 votes for Malcolm Turnbull and 35 for Peter Dutton. And uh, we've been talking about this two strike strategy for a first strike to be basically uh, ha having to be done on the spot with no planning. 35 votes is pretty good for having no uh, doing doing no planning at all i mean that that's a pretty serious blow it is and i believe it was our senior editor who made the comment today that 35 votes with a walking start is pretty impressive considering that you would only need eight votes to seven votes eight actually and oh yes yeah there was one informal vote Actually, there was, I was actually referring to Sinodinos as well. Sinodinos wasn't there. Mm. Um, there was there was a rumor going around that there was possibly an abstention. I don't know who the person who abstained was. I have a couple of theories, but I don't know for certain who it was. But if Sinodinos had been in the party room, it would have been 49-35. Thus, the change has to be eight rather than seven. And it was actually... Um, something that was uh, overlooked in the final analysis. I mean, you could actually change it with seven as well, I suppose, because it would be 42, 41 then, but that's based on the figures with Synodinus being absent 
it would actually have a tie of 42 all and then Turnbull would either have to do a Gorton and fall on his sword, which is highly unlikely to happen ever, or he's going to say, I'm still leader, screw you guys, I'm in, I'm still in the lodge. And now... The, yeah. Oh, sorry, you go. Yeah. Oh, well, Greg Hunt was supposedly going to be the, the deputy for Peter Dutton, but uh, Julie Bishop was the, the only nominee for a deputy leader. She's been the deputy now for, it'll be coming up to 11 years now, and she served uh, four leaders, uh, two stints with, with Turnbull. She's the, the ultimate uh, survivor, but everyone's thinking that if Turnbull goes this time, she's she she'll go as well i mean she's she's in her 60s now she's uh nearly well past her use by date <coughs> sorry excuse me um a couple of things i have to say about um julie bishop she's a very intelligent woman but she because she has been the deputy leader for so long she's only ever going to be seen by the more serious political aficionados as a lieutenant not as a general in her own right it is possible albeit very unlikely that she could in fact be put forward as a patsy leader for turnbull but i i'm not sure if she actually really wants it or not uh, if she does want it she doesn't want it enough I I don't know. I don't know. I don't see Bishop taking over as leader of the party. And it is possible that after another term or two, whether she remains deputy leader or not, she'll probably resign and retire. I mean, she used to work for Clayton Utes as a, I believe she was a senior partner at Clayton Utes in the Asia Pacific. So she's worked her whole life. She's probably going to look forward to not having to trek all the way from WA to Canberra um, every week, or almost every week for a parliamentary sitting. Now, after the result, uh, Peter Dutton, he uh, resigned as Home Affairs Minister. Uh, Turnbull initially refused the resignation. He wanted uh, Dutton to, to stay on, hoping to well, extend an olive branch, saying that we can work it out. But oh, Dutton, well, the official line is that he couldn't feel after saying the Prime Minister wasn't up to the, the job uh, serve in his cabinet. But of course, the, the real reason Dutton would go to the back benches so he can openly or state his uh, own positions on key issues and also uh, uh, plot uh, uh, more easily. Uh, now, uh, there was, everyone was uh, speculating initially where uh, Scott Morrison, the Treasurer, and Matthias Cormann, the Finance Minister, uh, were. They both voted for, for Turnbull. Now, Cormann, he did the numbers for Abbott in 2015, though he, well, Cormann, he is, he, well, he, he's, I'd say he's very calm and uh, I, I would say reassured uh, person. So he said, I served the Prime Minister loyally of the day, Dutton's my friend, uh, but uh, you know, my loyalty is to the, the Prime Minister and I'll serve him until the, uh, the, the next election. So they're the two people who kept uh, Turnbull in the job today. Mm -hmm. There is actually something I've got to throw in here um before we move on to the next topic or next subtopic rather um there was speculation this morning as to where was matthias Corman. i was speaking with um one of my friends in new south wales and admittedly he's a little bit removed from the scene he made the comment to me that there are seven six or seven dissident liberals who are not happy with Turnbull and would gladly welcome a change to Dutton as long as Abbott was never put back into the cabinet. Now, how true that is, I have not yet verified. And even when I do verify, I probably won't be saying anything until after it's done. But if that's the case, then Turnbull's in a, well, Turnbull's already in trouble. We, we already established Turnbull's already in trouble. He's in even more trouble now if that rumour that I heard from my friend in New South Wales turns out to be true because it means that they'll dump him as soon as Dutton makes a 
a promise to them that he's not going to put Abbott in, uh, into the cabinet. The thing is, though, Dutton, at least at this stage, Dutton has no intention of keeping Abbott out of um, the cabinet should he take over. Yeah, it's, there's been conflicting reports on that, which, which sort of implies that maybe Abbott would be out of ministry, maybe Veterans Affairs. It's possible. Or if Dutton wanted to stay leader for longer and not have Abbott as a challenger, give him the, the poison chalice of Minister of Health. That would be a cabinet position, but it would keep Abbott too busy and too occupied to uh, challenge if Dutton decides to sell out. Now, the reason why Dutton is so popular lately, and I wrote this in the article um, that I wrote for The Unshackled a few months back, is because he has become a new standard bearer for conservatives within the Liberal Party. His support for uh, white farmers in South Africa, for example, has been a uh, almost a beacon of hope to the disaffected and disenfranchised Liberal Party base. S however, this is the important thing to remember. Just because he says the right things does not necessarily make him conservative. He is conservative. Don't misunderstand me. He's definitely conservative. I mean, anyone's conservative compared to Turnbull, pretty much. You're conservative compared to Turnbull. I, well, I'm definitely conservative compared to Turnbull. But Dutton, despite the maligning of him, by the left and especially the rabid left, the green set calling him a fascist. He's not a fascist. He's conservative, but he's a small C conservative. He's not, he's probably less conservative than Tony Abbott, which would explain why people who voted for Turnbull over Abbott decided to vote for Dutton over Turnbull because Dutton would be a correction. I made this, comment on my Facebook last night, Dutton is required for a correction of where the Liberal Party is. Not a recalibration, but a correction of where the Liberal Party is, where it is going, and what its raison d'etre is. Now, when I published uh, the, the story this morning about the, the leadership spill, we hadn't heard from Turnbull and Dutton. And Turnbull, I think it was at about 12.30, gave a press conference saying that the, the party room vote was an overwhelming vote of confidence, that the party can now move on. And Julie Bishop <laughs> said the same thing. And, oh, <laughs> How can, how can, like, uh, the, the journos there, like, you can't see them, but it would have been interesting to see the looks on their faces. I mean, that is just the biggest load of garbage ever spoken in politics. Like, I, I, I know, I know. I mean, it's... <laughs> Sorry, don't mind me while I... I'll be over here laughing. You know, I, I didn't actually hear... I didn't actually watch the press conference because I was too busy talking to amongst other people, our fellow contributors and also my contacts from a variety of political parties picking their brains as to what they thought, comparing notes, etc. Um, I It might have been Mark Latham, it might have been someone else, pointed out that in the f first uh, spill that got that damaged Turnbull in 2009 that was organised by Kevin Andrews, the result was 49 to 35. Does that sound familiar to you? I yes. think it does. <laughs> and funny enough, it was over energy as well. I wish our politicians, especially the ones who claim to be historically literate, would pay attention to history. Santayana got it right. Those who are ignorant of history are condemned to repeat it. And... Turnbull is very ignorant of that history. I mean, he lost in 2009 over pretty much the same issue. And it, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty much the same issue that he lost the leadership over. Um, in regards to this spill that he called today, he, Turnbull, to his credit, understands that Dunn didn't do this out of any sense of disloyalty or base ambition. Dutton did it because people have asked him to. People have asked him to. The media, in a way, the mainstream media, have pushed him towards considering a challenge. Like I said, 
his interview on Thursday was a warning shot to the government not to roll, not to roll Turnbull, but to point out, look, we need to get our act together. We need to have a unified platform. Otherwise, we are going to lose and we're going to lose badly. So Turnbull, to his credit, does understand that Dutton's grumblings are not directed at him personally, although Turnbull may take them personally if a second spill happens, like he certainly did with Abbott's spill. Abbott was very reluctant to challenge, as you remember. So Turnbull never forgave Abbott, obviously. So when September 2015 came, he took his shot and he won. But the thing is, Dutton hasn't been saying anything to um, condemn Turnbull as a person or even as leader. He's just been pointing out, he's just been echoing the sentiments of the Liberal Party base. And that's what a good member of parliament, a good cabinet minister of the crown is supposed to do. We've got some issues here. We need to fix these. And Turnbull ignores that to his credit. That ignores that to his detriment, rather. And it's a big problem for Turnbull. As it is, he is now... Turnbull is now on the way out. It's a, it's a matter of whether it happens this week, next week, or next month. It's just a matter of when. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. At Dutton in his Garden press conference, he, he he's still keeping his cards very close to his chest, said that he was proud of his work in the Home Affairs portfolio and an on-border protection, and as well as his other ministerial work that he mentioned when he was Workforce Participation Minister and Assistant uh, Treasurer under John Howard and uh, Peter Costello. He, he didn't elaborate too much on why he put his hand up for the leadership, just saying that he would be a better choice to def for the, the party, better option to defeat Bill Shorten. Uh, he mentioned briefly uh, energy, immigration and infrastructure as the, the key uh, issues, which they, they are for conservatives, but didn't elaborate on them. And yeah, he was very careful not to dump on Turnbull, sort of make, sh make sure he presented himself as, as clean as possible. But we certainly had a lot more uh, questions for him. Yeah. Well, like I said, it's not a personal thing for Dutton. Dutton isn't challenging Turnbull because he wants him gone. Dutton is challenging Turnbull because somebody has to do it. It's the thankless task that Dutton has taken upon himself, assuming that there isn't some four-dimensional chess going on with Abbott pulling the strings. Mm. I don't believe that it's... I don't believe Abbott's behind it. He did that, um, yeah. He, he, uh, so. Dutton later on in the day did a sit down interview with our favorite uh, Sky News reporter, Laura Jays, uh, <laughs> where, where he said he'd continue to support the government but would not rule out a, another challenge, saying, oh, well, we've just had you know this contest today, oh, let's settle down a bit. But he also said that he was not a puppet of Tony Abbott's. He said, well, I'm doing this, yeah, like you said, because of uh, policy. And he also said that he wanted to show another side of himself which uh, I interpret as he just doesn't want to be seen as the, the head kicker, that, that that's basically been his job as Home Affairs Minister to you know get up in question time, spray labour on border protection, be the culture warrior on uh, 2GB. So uh, it looks like we'll probably be seeing uh, Dutton with uh, the wife and kids in uh, Sunday paper magazine saying, you know, like how much, you know, I love, you know, being a father and how much I care about, you know, all these. Uh, different things. Oh, yes. Oh, and speaking of kids, actually, um, this came to our attention last night. Um, there was a leak um, that came out of someone's office. <laughs> <coughs> <Sorry. coughs> oh, no, Hugh Remington, the 10 reporter, he said he did it all throughout his own research. It was oh, just of good course journalism. It's really convenient that it was the night before Turnbull decides to call a surprise spill. I call BS on that, Tim. And so should anybody with a half suspicious mind. Uh, the, the thing is, though, it's very interesting how this has happened. I mean, even if we were to give Turnbull the benefit of the doubt and assuming that he didn't leak it, the interesting thing is that there were some articles 
about there are quite a few articles in the Guardian and the Sydney Morning Herald and other publications if you can call them that uh, pointing out that as under section 44 what was the actual section Se section 44 subsection 5 yeah. I believe yeah it's part of um, section 44 cannot have a pecuniary interest directly or indirectly with the Commonwealth Public Service. Now, the thing that has gotten, now the thing that has raised questions by these journalists, um, opposition research, I guess you could cynically call it, is that this only came into effect in, on July 2nd this year, where they're paying money directly to the, um, the child care centres themselves, rather than the actual parents of the children in the child care. So it wouldn't exclude him. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. Bear in mind, I'm not a lawyer. It wouldn't exclude Dutton from sitting in the House of Representatives. It wouldn't exclude him from being elected to the House of Representatives back in 2016. It may, it may um, exclude him from running again for re-election in, in 2019, which is when the election will probably be. I don't think Dunn's going to be, even if he wins the leadership or even when he le wins the leadership, I don't think he's going to be in a hurry to declare a snap election. Pardon me. Um, another thing that needs to be um, borne in mind is that in regards to um, any potential ineligibility or potential disqualification issues, the government has to refer a dozen to the High Court if there is any cause for concern. So if Turnbull does do this, then you can tell that Turnbull is making it personal. Now, my suspicion, my gut feeling is that this story conveniently came out last night as a warning shot to Dunn to stay in line. And there were reports, albeit unverified, this morning before the leadership spill that last night Dutton went to visit Turnbull and had a very frank conversation. I'd always love to be a fly on the wall at these frank political discussions, as you uh, call them. Uh, yeah. it's Everyone was saying that if, or uh, like you said, uh, Dutton's not going to be referred to the High Court, but uh, it would start a new chapter in this Section 44 saga, which has already caused, if I count one, two, uh, three, uh, seven uh, by-elections uh, so far. And well, given that uh, this were uh, this uh, pecuniary interest in the Crown alleged one was brought about by changing legislation to childcare subsidies going to childcare centres, like wouldn't there have been, I don't know, you think that uh, the legislators would be alert to Section 44 now, especially after the Bob Day uh, decision where he, uh, he was leasing his office to the crown and, and back again and which ruled him ineligible you'd think that uh, the, the politicians will thought hey maybe you know we should be aware that we don't cause another section 44 crisis because uh, they have politicians have got pecuniary interest in all sorts of things mm -hmm. with these like they trusts do. and investment funds they do and trusts that are actually held in their spouse's name or in their children's name or a cousin's name even. So that also adds ambiguity to it. So they probably didn't think of it. So if they did think of it, they didn't think about it for very long. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, the legislation in question that could potentially put Dunn in trouble. It wasn't written with the intention of getting rid of him. Of course not. But it was something that does add more complexity to the interpretation of constitutional law. It does also add to um, what is counted. I mean, Andrew Bartlett, who is the formerly of the Democrats, now a Green Senator again, he had tenure at a university and he was, he was admittedly concerned about whether he was eligible at that point to replace, um, what's her name, Larissa Waters. But um, as it turned out, no, there was no issue. He was not referred to the High Court. It wasn't deemed to be um, 
justified to refer him to the High Court, so he didn't get um, he didn't get hauled over the coals over it. Even that, so I, I have a sneaking suspicion that Peter Dutton will have the same thing. There's an insufficient uh, cause for him to be prosecuted under um, or tested rather in regards to Section Forty Four, Subsection Five. Yeah, uh, well, it's not going to be something that uh, will be tested in the, the short term because the House has to uh, refer him. But uh, I, I'd say just uh, watch this space because if there's a politician who can they want to get rid of because of this alleged pecuniary interest, then that'll, that'll set up a chain reaction. But back to today and question time, Labor moved a no confidence motion, obviously trying to capitalize on the, the leadership turmoil. And it was telling who, uh, when it was the, the government's term, a turn to uh, speak against the, or it wasn't the no confidence motion, the suspension of standing orders uh, to move the no confidence uh, motion. Uh, Turnbull was uh, defended by uh, Michael McCormack, Deputy Prime Minister and Nationals Leader, which a lot of people are saying that if Turnbull goes, uh, McCormack is likely to be rolled as well, given that he's pretty much been a, seen as a, a weak, uh, ineffective uh, Nationals Leader. Uh, Julie Bishop, of course, uh, defended Turnbull, so did uh, Christopher Pine, uh, the, the beloved uh, Christopher Pine, and uh, Scott Morrison. And of course, they tried to turn it back on Turnbull, saying what a shoddy character he is, uh, what a danger he'd be uh, at the lodge. There was a lot of th theatrics there, but uh, <laughs> when you when you've sort of got the, I'd say the the usual su uh, suspects uh, defending Turnbull, it doesn't doesn't count for much. No, it doesn't. I was I was watching the um the, the question time, the the argument, the banter to and fro about the no confidence motion and I was just laughing the whole time because they were all so hypocritical they were all so hypocritical about it and I thought to myself oh wow you people should never ever take a blood detector test I mean Shorten is a horrendous character to be fair but so is Pine and I had to say that but he is you know this is this is the guy um, I'm not going to refer to in the same way Gillard did, at least on the show. <laughs> There's a lot worse we could say about Pine. Oh, of course there is. Yeah, well, you know, I thought the reference to him being a certain type of poodle was not very delicate or polite. But, you know, the thing with... Because I used to know um, Pine, and he impressed me. When when I met him, he impressed me because he gave a speech lamenting how professional politicians and careerist hacks had taken over the Liberal Party and how both <laughs> Mendes and Howard were lamenting the irony, the irony <laughs> and sheer rank hypocrisy of the fact yeah. he's became he became he became what he hates, uh. <laughs> and it's it, it's it's abhorrent. And you know, I actually thought to myself when I was looking at him talk, you were the chosen one. Because Pine at one point was on track, albeit the slow albeit the slow track, to become Prime Minister, leading the Liberal Party. Now he's basically ruined his chances by um, by sucking up to Turnbull at ad nauseum. Anyway, and they the thing is, McCormack, I haven't met McCormack, so I can't really comment on him but he is seen as weak and for good reason hmm. um i see him as weak you see him as weak. pretty much everyone who is remotely conservative even libertarians see him as weak um the other three i have a passing acquaintance with they had good points in attacking shorten because while i don't defend turnbull obviously they are right to attack shorten this is the purest most base opportunism that I've ever seen in a politician for a very long time. Shorten's, Shorten's motion, it, was a, it backfired because no one in the Liberal Party room, sorry, no one in the Liberal Party, it's only not the Nationals, were actually going to 
allow the no confidence motion to pass because that would a trigger the an immediate election and b it gave it gave the liberal party an enemy to focus on sure even if Dutton did hate Turnbull, which he doesn't, he hates Shorten far more. Yeah, I mean, uh, Shorten had no choice but to, or basically, or, uh, if he asked about anything else, would have been the element elephant in the room. He had to basically create chaos in the in the house to basically or well, keep the the turmoil going, but. Uh, there's been a, well, since question time today, there, it's been confirmed who voted for, uh, Peter Dutton, and we'll just go through those names now. So, obviously, Peter Dutton voted for himself, Michael Suka, uh, uh Minister Assisting the Treasurer, he has, uh, resigned, uh, Greg Hunt, the, uh, Health Minister, he, uh, he was going to be the Deputy, uh, Tony Abbott, no surprise there. Uh, Zed Zelja, he was another assistant minister who has resigned. Steve Chobo, the trade minister, he voted for Dutton. He has now resigned. Michael Keenan, uh, the, uh, what's he now, uh, social services minister, he's now resigned. Uh, no word on Alan Tudge yet. Angus Taylor, he's resigned. Uh, and uh, Conchetta Ferravanti Wells, uh, she's uh, resigned as well. So they're, they're the big names uh, in the, the ministry that uh, voted for Dutton. If we go across the page now, the other names Luke Howarth, the Queenslander, Nicole Flint, Conservative from South Australia. James Patterson, the Conservative Libertarian Senator from Victoria, uh, David Bushby from Tasmania, Ross Vasta, Conservative from Queensland, uh, Ben Morton, uh, WA uh, Liberal, James McGrath, oh, LNP uh, Senator Power Broker, he, he was also a minister, he's resigned, uh, Rick Wilson, um, I don't know where he's from, Scott Bookholtz, who was the the chief course, government, yeah. yeah, whip under uh, Tony Abbott. Uh, he voted for Dutton, obviously. David Fawcett, Liberal senator from South Australia. If we go over the page, uh, Tony Passen. Well, he was one of the uh, uh, neg uh, people who reserved the right to cross the floor. Jason Wood, a moderate, uh, he voted for Peter Dutton. Andrew Hasty, WA Conservative, no surprise there. Same with Kevin Andrews, no surprise. Erica <laughs> Betts, no surprise, voted for Dutton. Uh, Ted O'Brien, uh, do you know who he is? I don't know who he is. He's um, the member for Fairfax. He's oh, yeah. Uh, Amanda Stoker, new uh, LNP senator from Queensland. She voted for Dutton. Uh, Andrew Wallace, I don't know who he is. Andrew Wallace, I'm not familiar. I think I think he's new. Um, I think okay. he's new. I'm familiar with him. Karen Andrews, she's a Queenslander as well, isn't she? She is actually funny, funny, fun fact. When Peter Dutton was worried about losing his seat of Dixon in 2010, he actually went for pre-selection for McPherson against Karen Andrews and lost. Fun uh, fact. Yeah, and uh, a new Liberal Senator Jim Mullen. Well, he a conservative warrior throughout the years there's no surprises <laughs> there we look on the the final page uh dean smith uh senator from wa he's well he's deemed a moderate because of his same-sex marriage bill but he's pretty conservative on a lot of other issues and he was pushing for a population into uh oh an inquiry into population i should say in good enough uh wa conservative uh there andrew lemming well he you know he, he he's just sort of goes which way the the, the wind's blowing on, on the weather vane, thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> weather vane. Jonathan, I can't read that. Doonham. Am I saying that right? Jonathan, I actually need to. I actually need to maximise this so I can actually see. Um, Bert Van Manen was the the final one there, and I also heard that uh, Susan Lay she voted for for Dutton as well. That's what I heard. She's not in this uh, graphic, uh, which was uh, made up by Sky News, so we should thank them for for that. But that's the 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 Dutton uh, thirty five. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is there are. Like I pointed out earlier in the podcast, there are quite a few people who voted for Dutton, who this today, who voted for Abbott in 
uh, voted for Turnbull rather in 2015. Not all of these people who changed their allegiance from Turnbull to Dutton after changing it from Abbott to Turnbull are worried about losing their seats. If we go back to the um, if we go back to the graphics, um, the very first one. If we go yeah. back to the first one. Yeah. Okay. Um, Stephen Chobo. He's in a. He's the member for Moncrief. He's in a very safe seat. He's mm. not going to lose anytime soon. He voted. From my recollection, he voted for Turnbull uh, in 2015. But he switched his vote this time for Dutton. Why did he change his vote? Because his his seat is safe. It doesn't matter if the Liberal Party got pretty much wiped out. He would still hold on, albeit. Yeah, on a very slim that's margin. the Gold Coast. It's safe as. Exactly. Um, should be noted, Stuart Roberts uh, would have voted for Turnbull. Um, so, you know, not everyone in Queensland, despite the admonitions of um, Gary Spence, the LNP president, decided yeah. to follow his advice. Jane but Prentice uh, voted for, for Turnbull. Well, she's, <laughs> she's gone at the, the next election, so... But she still gets a vote. She, she chose to stick with Turnbull. Another key backer of uh, Turnbull was um, Christian Porter, the Attorney General. Uh, there was also Tim Wilson, uh, Trent Zimmerman voted for Turnbull. Uh, so did... shock. <laughs> uh, Trevor Evans did. Uh, who else mm. was there? Um, yeah, there, there was a separate graphic uh, made up for Turnbull supporters, but I wasn't able to, to find it. We should uh, start to wrap up now. Where to from here? A second spill is going to happen. It's just a yeah. question of when. The, most of the money is on when Parliament returns on the, the 10th of September. Malcolm Turnbull will have lost 40 news polls in a row uh, by that time. And uh, uh, basically that... Well, given that 30 was the benchmark to getting rid of Abbott, a uh, magical 40, uh, you would think that that would be the, the final death blow for, for Turnbull, and it's uh, not that hard to move eight votes in that time. There has been talk of could they just do it quickly and have another spill later on in the week? Who knows? I have stuff to say on this. I have to choose what I can say and what I won't say. Um, I was talking with a, I was talking with a member of the um, coalition who's in parliament last night and I asked him about m uh, what he thought of my thoughts. And he said I was, and he indicated to me that I was correct. He didn't say anything outright. He didn't say yes outright, but he did indicate that I was correct. Um, if Dutton doesn't become leader, he or doesn't become prime minister, he will lose his seat at the next election with all the amount of money that GetUp and other groups are pouring in mm. to the um, to the Dutton, to, particularly against him, which means they see him as a threat and a credible leader of the Liberal Party because he's somewhat conservative. Um, there has been from other sources, there has been a concerted campaign encouraging everyone in all of their social networks to email, pardon me, sorry, um, to email and phone their, and all of their MPs, not necessarily the ones who have already um, voted for Dutton, but the ones who are wavering a little bit. Uh, so for example, um, for example, you know, if there are people on the Gold Coast, if they wanted to call Stuart Robin and say, look, the Lib you know, members of the Liberal Party, obviously, um, say to Stuart Robert, for example, look, you've got to change your vote to Dutton should it come up again, mm. simply because of the fact that even though your seat is safe, you won't be in par you won't be in government for a very long time if you don't support Dutton, for example, something along those lines. You know, I actually got a message this morning uh, from one of my friends saying, you know, um, contact your MPs, uh, to contact your MPs, call them, email them, phone them, whatever. And I, I actually 
woke up a little bit later this morning to get the message until after the spill had already happened. Mm. And, and, you know, I mean, there will be another spill coming and it's important to prepare for the second spill. You know, the, yeah. the liberal yeah. base, liberal party base that is still conservative needs to start mobilizing if they want to save itself from, you know, being utterly wiped out of the next general election. Yeah. Our Turnbull's finished. It's just a matter of when the, the second spill, when the numbers uh, will align. But yeah, Dutton is definitely going to energise the, the, the conservative base. And uh, Corey Bernardi was asked on the Bolt Report night, would he be tempted to rejoin the Liberals? And he's like, oh, <laughs> just, <laughs> just uh, oh, uh, let, let's see what happens uh, first. It would definitely uh, get the, the base behind. But would the, because the, uh, that's what the, you know, the, the press gallery been saying like do the public know who peter dutton is would they would they warm to him yes like we love him us like culture warriors he's he's awesome he's the he's the head kicker we want he's the sort of person we want as leader but you know would he be uh sellable to the electorate there's there's this thing of or oh, you know would uh, victorians like him you know those progressive people down there that sort of uh chatter but let's remember that uh, tony abbott was called unelectable in 2009 he won uh, ne uh nearly won two elections that's right nearly won 2010 won convincingly in 2013 after after by the way rod had been returned to power after rolling gillard yeah so it's well de definitely i mean uh, they, they can't go or any worse uh, at the moment and Turnbull he's he's mortally like wounded he's he's a dead man walking uh, I think any anyone who's any commentator all agrees that he he's done for uh, it, it, yeah it's just a matter of of time but uh, we've been going for uh, over an hour uh, now um, so I think we'll we'll wrap this up but uh, of course we'll be keeping an eye on well Parliament for, for all of this week and and when it comes back again because they well, second spill could happen at any moment and we'll be back uh, live to uh, offer our analysis on it and uh, I'd say when, not if, we have a new Prime Minister. Mm, indeed. All right, so I'll finish off with the uh, normal uh, reminders. So uh, the Unshackled is going to be at the March for Men in Melbourne this Saturday, the 25th of August at 1 p.m. at Federation Square. It is designed to bring attention to men's issues and say that it's okay to be masculine. It's been organised by local social media personality Sydney Watson, the local campaign against racism and fascism, along with the National Union of Students Women's Department, and apparently it's uh, LGBT division as well. I've organised a counter protest against this so-called uh, far-right uh, racist and bigoted event so we'll be there to cover uh, the event from both sides uh, due in Australia next month is former UKIP leader and Brexit champion Nigel Farage uh, he's visiting Sydney Melbourne Adelaide Perth and Auckland as well so you can still get tickets including various VIP passes by going to nigellive.com.au also just been announced is the Tour of Australia by internet television personality and founder of the Proud Boys, Gavin McGuinness, this November. It's being hosted by uh, Penthouse Australia. Obviously, these leftist protests, they're, they're not deterring the uh, right-wingers from coming to Australia because we're, we just keep getting more and more of them. Uh, so you can book your place by going to uh, gavinlive.com.au. Also, if you want to make sure that uh, we can continue uh, to sustain the, the output we are at current, uh, please consider uh, becoming a patron of The Unshackled at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. So thanks everyone for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.